Great. Hi guys, I'm Ryan Smolar. I'm the initiator of the Placemaking US Network. Thank you for joining us and supporting us with your ticket. Uh, we're a nonprofit and we've been doing almost everything for free in our startup mode the last two years. And we're transitioning to a more user supported model. So thank you for continuing this journey with us. I also wanna acknowledge our global connector, Ethan Kent, who's between his house and his computer right now. Uh, and also our critical partner, Hans from Placemaking Europe. Thank you for being here, as well as Todor from uh, Placemaking Europe, who we've worked with so extensively to get started. Um, so this session is really about closing out 2022 and starting to look towards 2023. Uh, in 2022, we went to over a dozen place conferences in North America and Europe. And I've rounded up the top 50 ideas and concepts that I heard over and over again at these, at these places. And um, I'll be sharing about those. And it's a fairly intense data dump up front for the first maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but then I'll be asking you about you know, what resonated with your 2022 learning. Uh, and, uh, and then we're gonna start talking about 2023. Uh, I've gathered the dates of 22 events that are happening next year that might be of interest to people. And we can collaborate on this list and expand it to make sure that we're covering all the critical places where conversations are happening about places. Uh, lastly, I'm gonna share our network plans and we'll have time for you to share out also about your plans in 2023 and see where the synergies may lie between the network and what you're working on. So I do hope for this session to go for around an hour. So hopefully we can be very economical in our speech and try and give as many people the opportunities to share or use the chat box if you, if you want to as well. So let me go ahead and get started with a little presentation. Oops, let's go to the top. Okay, now the annoying question. Can everybody see the screen in full mode? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. All right, guys. So let us summarize 2022. Um, this year, as I mentioned, we went to over a dozen place conferences, a lot of them in North America, the Congress for New Urbanism, Downtown Association in Vancouver, Art of City Building in Halifax, the Place Leadership Summit in Schenectady, New York. Uh, we hosted a placemaking mastery program in Portland, which Jaron Sage, who's on the call, went to. We had an urban lab in Santa Ana, California, along with the Better Cities Film Festival that Chris came up for. Uh, we did a Florida road trip from Jacksonville to West Palm Beach with Katie, who's on the call. Uh, we went, Ethan and I attended a Place Leadership Summit in Washington, D.C. Uh, there were meetups held in New York City. And then in Europe, we went to Placemaking Week Europe in Ponte Vedra recently, the International Making Cities Livable Conference in Paris, Placemaking Week at H22 in Helsingborg, Sweden, Placemaking Day Budapest in Hungary with Hans, uh, who's on the call. We were at UN Habitat, the United Nations uh, urbanization event with Chris, Ethan, uh, Carmen was there, who's on the call as well, and others. Uh, we were at the Creative Bureaucracy Festival in Berlin, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, of all places. And uh, coming up, we'll be at Placemaking Day Malta next week. So the number one thing that we heard about in all of these conferences was about the climate crisis and as it relates to place. And this I swear is gonna be the most dense slide because I think there's a lot of concepts within climate that people might be confused about or uh, terms are kind of changing. And so I think it's kind of critical to a little bit deep dive into this, but I promise you the other slides will not be like this. <laughs> so, um, Number one is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this is a sustainable development framework put forward by the UN. Uh oh, sorry, somebody joined and I kicked this. Uh, this is a sustainable development framework put forward by the UN. And these are talked about in Europe extensively. People use these as a way of talking about 
the things that we can do to positively impact many different areas of climate change. You really don't hear people talk about this in the US that much. I think I heard somebody mention it once. And so it's a really, really great framework and something that's not well utilized here um, that's important. I think also the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. So this is like the doomsday clock out there. It's the definitive report on the numbers of how bad the climate change crisis is going. And it's something to really check with and be informed by um, as we're making these types of critical changes that we need to to our economy and to the way we do our work. Um, net zero and decarbonization are also really, really talked about elsewhere as a way for governments and places to move forward in, the, in their transition and transformation of their economies. So net zero basically means neutralizing the amount of carbon produced by human activities. And we heard, for example, at the uh, World Economic Forum that the Paris Games in, uh, in 2024 are gonna be a net zero event. So governments are staking uh, positions to be net zero, to decarbonize so that they can set up uh, pathways for more people to take those steps. Uh, when we were in Copenhagen this summer, the, they were telling us about that like, Copenhagen had the audacious goal to be net zero by 2025. And as I was checking the date for the, this presentation, a month ago, they reneged on the promise because part of it was based on uh, technology that doesn't exist yet. And so they're actually pushing back that goal uh, and we're stumbling um, with, our, with these sort of steps towards decarbonization net zero. Another really, really talked about concept within the climate crisis is circularity or the circular economy and the donut economy. So circularity is the idea of using waste products as the fuel for other industries. Uh, so like cradle to cradle might be a term that you've heard here. Vancouver is doing cradle to cradle connecting and Amsterdam city has significant strategies for both uh, circularity and the donut economy. And the donut economy is a theory put forward by economist Kate Renworth in her book, The Donut Economy, that says that the ceiling of economic growth is actually the destruction and collapse of the biosphere. So all of our economic models are based on the idea of infinite growth, but if you realize that as our economies grow, the, uh, the biosphere will collapse, that that's actually a hard limit. And the lower limit of the donut is basically not having enough for the people that are alive. Uh, ESRs and CSRs was another interesting concept that I think is, is really big for place. If you follow what Project for Public Spaces is doing, they're doing a lot of CSR work and also doing CSR regranting for placemaking. And a lot of us have probably heard about that. It's corporate social responsibility. So it's corporations who are trying to make a positive impact. But ESR uh, was a big topic at the World Economic Forum because companies are realizing that there's going to be limitations put on them and that they're going to be having to change. And so they're having to demonstrate in their books how they're making a positive impact to uh, the environment. So these are huge funding levers for creating positive change in place uh, and reducing carbon um, that we should be talking about. So another thing that was talked about a lot at these high government levels is the idea of transition and the newer term transformation. So transition is the concept of moving off of the current model of burning carbon resources to create energy to make our economy go. But transformation means we are now up against a wall and we completely have to shift and change now to something completely different. So it's a, it's a more serious term uh, to say, to talk about transformation versus transition, which made it seem like we had a lot more time than we do. Uh, climate mitigation and adaptation is kind of a very similar concept where mitigation is obviously reducing the amount of waste and energy uh, in our buildings and in our environments and, and our ways of doing business. Adaptation is really more about employing flexibility, agility, and resilience for when things like the sea level rises and buildings have to change and things have to move uh, and planning that into uh, what we do. 
<laughs> Gesundheit. <tight. laughs> um, also huge is uh, climate refugees and mass migration. So there's a lot of populations that are moving around. Um, we heard in the US about like these migrant trains, things like that. We're really at the tail end of what's happening. And there's a lot of people who are being forced out of their, their cities, their countries due to agricultural collapse, due to different climate shifts and changes. And that pressure is gonna keep mounting to really high levels where it's going to be a permanent um, reality for us. And then also, uh, Ethan and I have talked about, you know, disaster relief and the economics of disaster relief are actually really interesting in that, uh, for example, at the UN's uh, Habitat event, Africa and other global South nations were really upset about Ukraine because it had become such a darling that all of the aid resources shifted to supporting the, the refugees from Ukraine, whereas the others are also part of that same economy. And so we need to do, we need better ways of working with populations who are being displaced by things like wildfires, floods, wars, famines. Okay, so I told you this was a really heavy slide and I don't think I was lying. So we'll move on to the next, uh, I think, big topic that was talked about a lot and that's housing and affordability. And so I think some of the really interesting things that were discussed within this realm was uh, tiny house villages and the opportunities that those are making for both affordability, but also for uh, the houseless to, to come together, live in not just the housing first model, but what's being called the communities first model of giving the, that wraparound service and support um, to these new type of pop-up places. Uh, gentrification and redlining, this, along with homelessness, these are the hottest topics in the US. And the fact that our cities haven't recovered yet from redlining, uh, from uh, urban renewal, from urban housing, uh, and now the, the, those areas are becoming much more attractive and displacing people is one of the top issues talked about in the US. And whenever you try to talk about placemaking, people want to know about the gentrification aspects of it, the ownership aspects of it, the cultural aspects of it, the historical aspects of it. So it's the number one topic. A huge opportunity that's been talked about is the conversion of offices. You know, people are not going back to the office. Uh, maybe they're doing hybrid models. Maybe they're not going back at all. Maybe they've moved out of the city. And so the uh, marketplace for offices, we're seeing them convert into other uses like laboratories, as well as housing. Uh, Chris, who's on the line, has brought up that a lot of the old churches that are in our downtowns are starting to redevelop also, uh, often into housing uses and other, and other uses that um, create affordable housing. Our malls are dying. There's, I think, something like one third to two thirds of the malls that are built are now gone, are, are, are empty or dying. And so the, a lot of them are being revitalized by turning into lifestyle centers that uh, where they build towers on site to revitalize the retail district and the housing integrated into one. And then interestingly, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about freeway removals, but a lot of freeway and bad infrastructure is being removed and the number one usage that's being proposed in, in when this land gets freed up uh, is uh, housing. And so um, another interesting topic is suburban retrofit. So this has often been the, the densifying of suburbia, um, adding more uses to it. Uh, in California, for example, we've passed a law that allows you to open a restaurant in your home so people can actually um, get their meals and meal delivery same day from their neighborhood and not have to travel to a commercial district. Uh, there's been an incredible amount of ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds that were put into affordable housing subsidization. So we're seeing a lot of projects that might have been in the pipeline become developed. And there's a huge boom in housing construction. Also transit oriented development, a lot of infrastructure money has come out of the, the infrastructure bill. Uh, and so a lot of that is building new transit, which in, in line is also building new housing along with the transit. 
Uh, also, we're seeing a huge boom in new urbanism and master site development. So, you know, cities are not working as much with small developers in the market, but instead are aggregating large pieces of land and, and doing single site productions of, um, of buildings. So that, you know, for example, in Chicago, the entire, an entire stretch along the Chicago River that is very, very long is all gonna be developed by one developer. It'll have the feeling that it's multiple blocks and being developed by different people, but it's single site control. And definitely in the Congress for New Urbanism, uh, they took us to tons of these types of sites that are being built across the country. This picture I'm showing you looks like it's maybe Brooklyn, but this is actually rural Texas. This is a brand new housing development in rural Texas that we went and visited. And there's tons of sites like this being developed. Um, also, of course, brownfield remediation in the Rust Belt. Uh, we're seeing there's a lot of programs for taking old industrial sites, turning them into other uses like housing, uh, commercial centers, creative uh, places for creatives. Uh, also, Yimbyism has been a big thing on the rise. This is the yes in my backyard movement. And it's a response to um, basically the people who have denied at public meetings for people to do, to build things like uh, homeless services or affordable housing in their neighborhoods. And so the Yimbis organize as a response so that there is somebody saying, you know what, I have a house and I shouldn't be discriminating about, against future people that don't have access to housing. Um, and so that, that movement has gone wildfire in the US. Uh, also the talk of heating and cooling centers, and this relates to um, the climate crisis that most people actually die because of climate change, because of overheating and social isolation, or coming up now with uh, energy costs rising so much, uh, there's a big fear that the people won't have the money to heat uh, their apartments. And so the, this is pretty much becoming a ubiquitous thing that we're having to host uh, heating and cooling centers. So something else that's pretty exciting um, as I reflect back on it is the period of government innovation that we're in. Uh, I think that the pandemic obviously created this situation and I think the placemaking Europe's after covid.city agenda that a lot of us worked on really covers a lot of what is happening positively in government because of it. Uh, but just to go over some of it is uh, this thing I'm calling uh, break it till you make it. And I think we've seen rapid policy innovation happening or iteration happening in government where you know a lot of the rules that make place making so hard, they've been on the books for 50 years and they feel unchangeable, uh, but in, during the pandemic and after, we've seen policies go up and immediately somebody says, hey, you left us out. And the policy gets iterated and adapted to that error. And we've seen multiple voices and multiple rounds of revision happen very, very quickly on new policies and new ways of doing business that have been much more inclusive and have allowed government to dial in you know exactly where where the policy needs to be right now, and I think that's a really new and novel thing. I think there's been also a ton of experimentation in the sub granting bonanza that's occurred uh, through CARES Act and ARPA funding, both federal uh, funding programs that trickle down to state and county and city and even uh, indigenous nations so that government has become a lot more experienced in working with third parties, regranting funds and trying to get results through other sectors instead of trying to go it alone. And I think that's changed the structure of government. Also, the government, part of almost the defund the police idea, government doesn't have the resources to police everybody and to, to squash a lot of the things that I think most people feel like that there, there should be a, way, a path for. And so they've done a lot of legalizing the underground economy. Um, in California, the governor just signed a bill from um, our Alan and my uh, congresswoman that completely legalized street, street food, 
uh, street food retailers, which is a huge issue in California because you have people who've come here from countries where that is an accessible way of, of starting a business. And here it's, there's not really a clear pathway on how to do it. And so they, they broke it so that now it, it has to be fixed and it's also possible to, for a pathway for people to move forward with that, that what was formerly illegal. Also exciting uh, at the Creative Bureaucracy Festival and UN Habitat, they talked about evidence-based policies. So they're saying that a lot of what leaders need is evidence and data and proof that an idea is workable. And I think placemaking really has a critical role in this because our lighter, quicker, cheaper activities can lead to results that create data sets for further implementation. So it's really a sweet spot for us to do our placemaking, gather data, and, and then as Chris, who's here, tells us, you have to turn the data into a story. Um, you know, it's critical that this, the narrative that gets created with the data helps sell the idea further. We've also seen a lot of um, experimentation around universal basic income. And uh, in particular in the arts, uh, the biggest UBI experiment is going on in New York State funded by Carnegie. And the problem I, that I think we have here is many, many more people are applying than can actually participate in the program. But there's a lot of learning going on around basically paying people uh, a, a base income uh, or even paying their rent for them so that they can work and not worry about trying to make bills. Uh, also in this time, creative and uh, forgivable financing has become a really big thing where people realize that okay, we've made capital really hard for a lot of people to get and they're remaining you know, poor, unhealthy, they're having bad outcomes and it's costing society a lot of money. So it's actually better to give people money, uh, make capital accessible, make it forgivable and let people into the, the stream of producing for themselves. And that's actually much less costly than uh, keeping capital away from entrepreneurs and trying to solve everybody's problem on the back end. Of course, we all know about parklets and slow streets. These have increased, parklets have increased by tens of thousands in big cities. Uh, it's completely become ubiquitous and well-known and now it's iterating through into a more permanent uh, place in our, in our, in our cities. Um, Alan, who's on the call and, and us as well, um, really advocated that uh, beyond just par parklets for dining, that parklets can really serve other uses as well. And so we actually helped get the first non-dining parklet in our city for a Cambodian trauma center uh, to host on their, they host a, a night market on their parklet and they call it the night marklet. So uh, we, we've put that framework forward that, uh, you know, lots of uses can occur also, uh, I think Stipo and uh, Anna Bradley from Stipo has really put forward the active uses of parklets uh, and, and that it, it could be um, for activity beyond just that, that norm. Okay, so some other really interesting topics that have been talked about widely are in the transportation infrastructure and place-led development realm. And so place-led development is a concept I think that Hans is really promoting in Placemaking Europe. And the idea of let's create the life between the buildings before we create the buildings. If we seed a great place, then the development around it can be more intentional. Uh, it can occur over time uh, and it can net greater results and be done with uh, lower startup costs. So there's a really interesting conversation that he's leading and placemaking Europe, uh, but it has international involvement and implications. Here in the US, freeway removals, we think it's the biggest thing ever. Uh, you know, $1 billion was put towards removing freeways and we're on the front lines of this thanks to my colleague, Madeline Spencer. Uh, when the freeways get removed, who decides what happens with the land? Well, Madeline's working on best practices for uh, impacted community to take control of the land. And there's already a great example of this in Vancouver where they got to 60 to $70 million worth of value and able to build affordable housing. 
Uh, and there's terrible examples like our friend TJ in Halifax where they're removing uh, some freeway infrastructure and they didn't even talk to the community who they built the freeway over. And the plan is to build 12 faceless towers of luxury apartments basically in the place of what used to be this African Canadian community. Um, another really interesting thing that we heard about this year was nature-based services. So nature-based services or NBS is uh, a concept of using the ecology around you, the ecological services uh, for benefits to lower your energy costs. So an example is using an adjacent river or underground spring to cool a building. And there's a whole list of maybe a hundred nature-based services that could be uh, intricated into any development and stuff that we can look for to lowering costs, but also um, for, for transition to another type of uh, energy sources. Also, multi-purpose infrastructure is super important. Um, there's a ton of bad infrastructure being built with Recovery Act funds, with infrastructure bill funds. And it's a great time to advocate that our infrastructure have a higher purpose, you know, that it include green space, road diets, space for people and recreation. Singapore is a great example of this. And we also saw local examples in Jacksonville, Florida, where um, Katie Yellow's friend, Ennis Davis, he utilized leftover funds for a roadway project to build a road diet, create a plaza and fill it with public art and create basically the heart of the community in a former roadway. So it's really important to get in front of those infrastructure dollars because you can really advocate for how those projects are finished. And that can include a lot of support for people. Um, also really big fan of the Incremental Development Alliance who we became acquainted with both through our road trip for the recovery, but also they're heavily involved in the Congress for New Urbanism. And uh, I think more people should know about these guys. They're a group that teaches the community to become small scale developers. And there's good and bad developers out there, but when people develop their own community, they typically have an insight into what the community needs and they build for that community versus building for new outsiders to come in. Um, we also saw some very interesting conversations at our Placemaking Mastery uh, event in Portland with Greg Reisman uh, from the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And he showed us how Portland built nearly 100 miles of bike boulevards in the last few years. The secret, don't call them that. <laughs> by changing the conversation to uh, building neighborhood greenways and slower streets, PBOT got rid of the resistance and got everyone on board on building this new infrastructure. And so the language that we use when it's divisive or when it's different or when it's new, it can turn people off. Whereas really making everyone a partner in the change, uh, he saw dramatic results that every city needs to see. Uh, also, I think talked about a lot case studies this year were New York's Open Streets and Oakland's Essential Places programs. So New York's Open Street program has turned a lot of heads and it's particularly interesting because of its use of subsidiarity in management, meaning that these open streets, which are essentially closed down roadways, they're managed by local communities. They're managed by the business improvement district. They're managed by a group of residents. And so the programming and the active activation of it is incredibly diverse. And also it's what that community wants and needs. Also Oakland's essential places program was an iterative government move where they had at the beginning of the pandemic kind of arbitrarily shut down and slowed streets but they ended up making transportation more difficult for their essential workers. So in learning about what critical um, pathways there were for essential workers, they created a new network that served them first because they were the ones who needed to get where they needed to go. Um, I also wanna shout out to Social Life's, the Social Life Project's 11 transformative agendas for social life infrastructure. Um, this is all like really the, the basics of building a great town or neighborhood, you know, how sidewalks work, how markets work, how public institutions work. Uh, 
I, I really didn't understand how a square worked until I slept in Fred Kent's basement and he took me around and showed me. That. So I think it's really critical to check out that the article that they have on these really basic concepts, but that are so core. And if you don't get them, and a lot of our cities were built in ways that don't honor these truths, um, you're really going to miss the boat. And then another also huge thing this year has been the conversation on Strodes. And if you haven't read uh, Chuck Marone's new book, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, um, you need to because it describes in depth the terminal disease that all American cities have. So obviously another huge topic is placemaking and placekeeping for all. And uh, this is all pretty basic stuff. I don't need to explain much of it, just read off the headlines, but Placemaking Europe and the United Nations as well have been huge advocates for kid-friendly cities, um, cities built for children, but also informed by children. Uh, also, we've heard a lot of, of placemakers come to us and say, you know, they wanna see more play, more mental health, more active spaces in their cities. Uh, it's been great to see the connection made between mental health and place and social capital and social isolation. Those are huge areas of growth and funding um, for what we do. Also, uh, racial reconciliation is a huge topic and something that a lot more people are talking about and more importantly, doing things about. Uh, we've seen a lot of new hires in the place management industry of young, talented African-American leaders. Uh, I know Allen's uh, Business Improvement District in downtown Long Beach just hired from within a guy who's probably in his 30s, Austin, uh, who's really excitingly taking over one of the biggest business improvement districts in California. Um, also, uh, downtown DC just hired uh, an another African-American candidate from within. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of promotions of people who've been in the game and who might not have been recognized in the past and they're taking leadership roles. Uh, but one of the most exciting, I think, national conversations around this topic is uh, the CNU's Black Caucus, uh, who really, really just outshined their whole entire conference in Oklahoma City with the different types of leaders from the transportation sector, the development sector, uh, and, uh, and, and urban planning as well. So another interesting topic in this has been that, you know, spaces aren't neutral and having a culture forward approach towards uh, public space, which I think Carmen Mays talked a lot about at uh, Placemaking Europe um, and the idea of obviously monument removal and renaming of, uh, of assets in our city that are named after either racist or um, just inappropriate things that people just don't want to support or see in the, in the public realm anymore. Uh, land acknowledgement ceremonies at, at the, uh, especially in Canada, the, the sort of conversation about the, the unseated lands is, is fever pitch. Um, it's just, you know, a action is really going to happen because they're talking about it so much. Um, so it's really exciting to see that, that conversation. Also, the idea of gender neutrality, you know, it, often we see the binary male, female, um, but there's, people are identifying as many different types of genders now. And so um, making either gender neutrality or being very open to all different types of genders is something that I think we're seeing a lot more. Uh, the conversation about sacred civics really exploded this year that, you know, there, there's places that could be quiet places, solemn places. Almost every city approved funding in their ARPA plans for a COVID memorial. And these memorials now shouldn't just be plaques and, and things like that, but they should be places. So uh, that's a huge conversation that's opening up. We also starting to see some exciting evolution in the place management field. Um, Tim Tompkins, who's here, was on an awesome panel with Mary Rowe from Placemaking Canada uh, and Michael Blaze, who formerly, uh, who was with New York, all of their business improvement districts. And they're talking about, you know, business improvement districts have really evolved beyond just being about business. 
Uh, they're, they're, they're really working on social issues at, almost more than anything. And so um, utilizing the success that they've had in place management, how do, what, what does the future of that look like? What does the, the revenue structures look like? What, what do the management structures of that look like? And I think we're at the precipice of really evolving that concept. And uh, then there's uh, digital placemaking, which is really, really something that we were kind of laughing at Carmen and I the other day, but actually I think there's a lot to this. Um, so one thing is obviously QR codes. This technology has been around for a long time and nobody's really used it. But now even your grandparents, you know, know to pop their phone out and use that uh, app to get the, the menu and order their, uh, their dinner. But this technology actually has a lot of more implications. For example, it could be used for community engagement instantaneously at the site that's being changed. We actually used it by embedding it in a mural of books and you could use your, your phone to rent um, digital books and audiobooks off of the from the library right off of the, the wall in a public place. So I think that this technology um, has a lot of implications. Uh, augmented reality, AR, has also popped up a lot um, at the Creative Placemaking Leadership Summit in New York. Um, we, uh, we saw a, a group that they use the, the monument removal. So there's been a lot of monuments that have come down across the US and now the pedestals are there with nothing on it. And so they actually used AR to put up different things that community generated as what they'd like to see so that without making permanent investment, um, different ideas could be put up and experienced at those spaces. Obviously work from home and meeting in the metaverse uh, is gonna be a much bigger thing now since the pandemic, we're in the metaverse right now. Uh, so it, there's a lot of good to it. Um, also in the World Economic Forum in Davos, they talked a lot about autonomous light electric vehicles. And so this is like smaller vehicles that are, have, are robotically controlled um, and that do things like, like neighborhood delivery. And we were just in Pontevedra, Spain, where uh, with Placemaking Europe, and there they've removed uh, cars from their city center, creating this wonderful place for people, um, revitalize their economy, but they still have to allow delivery vehicles into the center. And so every once in a while, a giant van cruises by at 30 kilometers an hour, uh, whatever that means. So, uh, this is an interesting thing because I think like the next step for a city like that might be to have logistics outside of the city and then smaller vehicles delivering to the individual businesses within the city. Um, so this has implications for uh, reducing um, parking uh, minimums and road widths and really could be a panacea for us. Another thing that, I mean, it's kind of complicated and out there, but this was the main thing they were talking about at the World Economic Forum is Web3. And Web3 is NFTs, cryptos, crypto, and the DAO. And the DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. And I think I won't get too into that, but if you guys are interested in that, we can follow up on that. Um, also, as data and our pictures are being scanned in public and we're using our devices to purchase things, privacy is a huge issue that's out there, as well as polarization where um, people, because they've retreated to social media, media, um, and not interacting as much in public space, uh, you know, our nation is critically divided between people and it's just at a fever pitch and very threatening. So the, the need for people to come together in public spaces uh, is, so, is very critical. Also, the role of maker spaces in placemaking can't be understated. Um, when we did our road trip for the recovery, we encountered multiple places where um, designers are using 3D printing, CNC routing machines, all that type of technology to create solutions in place that are light, quick, cheaper. Better Block uses these technologies a lot to create simple places and solve problems. And then another huge issue in this is the digital divide and rural access. So 
you know, we have to acknowledge that as we digitize, a lot of people don't have access to this types of technology, whether it's because they don't know how to use it or they're a digital immigrant or because they are in an area without access to the internet. So I see that we're kind of low on time. So I'm gonna just kind of cruise through this to 2023 and go over some of our, uh, what we know is out there. And then we can also um, share what we're up to next year. So I've created a um, quick global placemaking calendar for next year. And let me go ahead and share that link with you guys. Let's see. Boom. Okay. Cool. Okay, so there's a link for you to check out this document in your, the chat, but I'll also email it out to you. And it just covers about 20 different events happening next year. Some of these events are um, uh, in person. Some of them are, are virtual or hybrid. Uh, and so you, I think I really wanna highlight the Placemaking Europe event for next year. They don't have a destination exactly yet, but they do have the dates, which are September 26th to 30th. And I think it's really clear that this is the critical gathering place for the global placemaking movement where as many of us as possible should try to get there. Um, this year we saw a lot of great placemakers make their way there. Cheryl Muriente, Carmen Mays was there, the folks from PPS, Ethan. Um, we had fellow North Americans from Mexico and Canada as well. Um, so I think that um, we should all make our effort really to go there. If you are planning to go to any of these events, please check in with us and let us know because then we can try and connect you with other placemakers who might be attending as well. So that's for you guys to check out and add to. So what about us, Placemaking US Network? What are we gonna do next year? So some of the things that we're hoping to develop next year is first of all, something that we've wanted to do really since we started, which is um, technical assistance projects. And we did a, a kind of test run of this recently in my business improvement district in Cal Southern California, where we had Guillermo Bernal from Placemaking Mexico come. And we did a series of pop-ups and worked with our Latino community and we just made so much happen and put so many plans together that can with the community that can be enacted upon. And so this model is where we would take some placemakers um, and bring them to a locality, do a lot of learning, do a lot of engagement and outreach, and then leave behind a lot of options for next step things that could be done in that community to continue moving forward in the right direction. We also want to write a best practices or good practices guidebook on food and place. Uh, we've had some really amazing connections with top international leaders in food. And I have a background of the last 10 years leading our local food policy council. And so we'd really like to partner with Slow Food International, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and other organizations in the food space to talk about all of the great things that can be done around food placemaking uh, that makes food more accessible, that is uh, creates vibrant local economies, um, and that decarbonizes and creates more social infrastructure for our cities. We're also excited to follow in placemaking Europe's footsteps and develop MOUs, uh, working agreements with different local jurisdic jurisdictions. While of course we value the primacy of the local placemakers, um, what the value that, that different municipalities and business improvement districts uh, are seeing in connecting with us is that we're connected to the broader global placemaking movement, uh, best practices that are out there, practitioners who they should be, they or their placemakers should be speaking to, and also helping them share out their successes to uh, a more global audience. Uh, we always like to have kind of a big crazy idea on the bucket too, <laughs> um, and our, our road trips and uh, have been really successful. And so what we want to do next year is uh, we're calling train the trainers and we're going to take one of the Amtrak lines across the country 
and make up to 10 stops along the way um, to do train place making trainings. So hopefully we'll definitely be stopping in Birmingham, Alabama to see Carmen. I hope we can stop over in Raleigh and see Tina. Definitely be in Washington and New York. And we'd love to hit up some small communities on our way to New Orleans. Also, um, in looking at how placemaking Europe has evolved and also speaking to uh, Guillermo Bernal and, and placemaking Mexico, um, we really see a future for the network in letting people lead in the spaces where they are just giants. And so we've realizing that some of the people that we've been working with, they're really amazing uh, examples, but also speak very well to different types of audiences and issues. And so we want to really be a platform for different professionals working in the field to take ownership for an, of an arena and to help push these ideas out to more and more people. And so these, some of these people have just been really, really amazing to work with. Um, and uh, there's a lot more than, than these six, but I just wanted to highlight um, our dear friends who have really grown our network because of the amazing roles that they've taken on in, in, their, in their own practice and that they've shared with the, the greater community. So we're also very interested in developing the idea of placemaking weekends. Uh, placemaking weeks have been a big thing, but that's the thing, they're a big thing. And these weekends can be a smaller gathering, more like our Portland Mastery Program. Uh, and I just highlighted some of the cities that I think we have fantastic relationships in, uh, where it would be an obvious place to, to launch a placemaking weekend. Uh, this would be trainings, tours, activities, and networking um, in these different localities. And I think that placemaking weekend San Francisco is probably going to be one of the first ones that we enact next year. So, okay, I shared both 2022 and 2023. So I hope that the 2022 stuff was useful for you guys, but also that in starting to look ahead to 2023, you either have ideas you're excited about, or you want to maybe even just make a, a promise now on something exciting you want to do. So I'll stop sharing and we'll open up the floor to see what you guys all have to say. Ethan, you're applauding, so you want to kick us off. Um, yeah, that was, wow, that was an amazing overview. It brought back many memories and it's wonderfully weaved together so many people and places and you know, conferences that <clears throat> have happened over the last year. So, um, but yeah, I, I am eager to hear from people about some of the thoughts, you know, what's resonating with them, what are the topics and issues that are most important to focus on, what are um, you know, some of these events that have been mentioned next year that we can organize around, get some momentum around, um, you know, it, obviously we, you know, it sort of takes a, we say it takes a place to create a community and a community to create a place. It's the same with these events and activities and programs. So we sort of want to, you want to do it both ways. There's some concrete ideas and programs that Ryan's put forward for in events. Um, but we also love to hear, I think what, um, be useful to hear people's general thoughts on where this is all going, where it should go, what the biggest challenges are we're, we're facing that we need to get ahead of or that kind of thing. Don't all be polite little placemakers. It's time to make your make your mark on the on the next year and, and make it happen. Um, well, hey y'all. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. So I am building out some things that I'm going to be doing. Um, I was reading um, ARPA guidelines um, last night, rereading them, the, the, the final rule overview to look at how some of the things that I want to do fall within the ARPA guidelines as there are multiple cities who have yet to really designate what they want to do with funds. Uh, so don't think it's too late <laughs> to get into the game as it relates to ARPA funds. Um, but something that's gonna be significant in Birmingham next year 
is that 2023 is the 60th, the 60th anniversary of 1963, which was very significant in Birmingham and the American Civil Rights Movement. It is, uh, you got the letter from the Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King, the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church, as well as the Children's March, which is that famous CBS, I believe, footage in the black and white with the uh, fire hoses and the German shepherds. So um, there will be, there are other things that happened. Um, it is the precursor to Freedom Summer, which is 64. So they'll be celebrating that next year, but also sit ins at, um, Woolworth counters. Um, there, there was a lot of things that either happened in history or were, were the ground was set for things to happen subsequently. Um, so, you know, I have been, uh, I'm inviting anyone who wants to jump on this with me to think about where placemaking fits into these commemorations and celebrations. Um, there are some ideas that I do have around creative, like using placemaking for conflict resolution and involving current, um, current having currently incarcerated people design um, reflective space for people who are outside of the jail. Um, and um, that's gonna be a heavy lift. So I'm, I'm already working on building partnerships there. And um, also doing talks about um, what to do with space that is kind of just in limbo because, you know, nobody knows what to do with the space <laughs> um, where all these things happen. So it, it, um, Ryan came to visit during the road trip and we were talking about how it's like just it has not it hasn't been economic development there. Um, and things like that. So anyway, before I take up all the time, if that's something that you're interested in and in jumping on with me, uh, please reach out. Uh, the more the merrier. So, you know, we just figure out um, how this works. And there's a potential funder um, who's already um, in the market and who was also at Placemaking Europe. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, they're on the call. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how all this works. Thanks, Carmen. I just want to reiterate, I think that's a really good thing. And I think every American should go to Birmingham, Alabama and visit the Civil Rights District. It was on our road trip, one of the top two things that I saw and it changed, you know, everything I know about our country and to, to understand that the civil rights movement really was a neighborhood fight. Uh, in, in, in that context was pretty amazing. So I hope we can get behind and support that. And um, Tim, uh, you know, you had your talk at, uh, at IDA this year at the Downtown Association. And I'm curious what, uh, you know, will you continue to evolve that discussion? Because I think you're one of the most important uh, voices in the, how business improvement districts operate uh, in the U.S. And I think that you know, you, you're really asking some important questions. And I think that the, the people are here to, to really involve that concept with you. So first of all, I just want to say thank you for that amazing summary. So enlightening. And, and I, I, I want, at the IDA conference, which was for bids, the focus was how does a bid model need to evolve? Partially because they've become, they've moved into things beyond the real basics of place management into community building at their best but also that there's still uh, faults in the, in the model in terms of how, how they work in less resource neighborhoods. And maybe there's a need to combine things like land trusts and tax increment finding and funding and greater government support in lower resource neighborhoods for the essence of what bids at their best are, which is placemaking entities. But also my background before this was working in parks. And so I've also had conversations with the City Parks Alliance uh, uh, and a lot of conversations with Ethan. And I really think that having, uh, what I'm really interested in exploring more deeply across jurisdictions and countries is um, how government takes more formal steps to really have policies that incentivize nuanced neighborhood-based 
um, community building that begins with placemaking but goes relates to a lot of other things and how random it is in so many places and it, it's luck of the draw whether you get a politician that gets it or doesn't um, and to look at you know what some of the structures are out there ranging including things like the MOUs in Europe that people are talking about to um, other things and I think that you know the optimism that we saw during COVID of the government innovation um, I'm very worried that that just, you look at outdoor dining, it's already snapping back into the old bureaucratic ways of shutting things down or being very rigid and not neighborhood responsive, one size fits all. And so I'm very interested in these longer term explorations, which I, I very much hope the placemaking folks and the City Parks Alliance folks and uh, placemakers and, and bids from across the world will uh, look at collectively in terms of what are the really more formal structural ways in which government is supporting both financially and structurally and, and incentivizing neighborhood empowerment um, and placemaking is the is kind of case the fundamental case study for that. Thank you, Tim. Maybe I can add a little bit uh, to that. Um, uh, I'm uh, Hans from Placemaking Europe. And um, we have the experience that um, in our previous placemaking weeks, we uh, uh, gathered a lot of the, the happy bottom-up placemakers from all over Europe, of course, and which is what we're here for, primarily. Oh. Everybody felt that, uh, okay, I'm not the only crazy person in the world, and there's actually a family waiting for me that I didn't know about yet. And maybe we would attract a handful of people from municipalities and some real estate developers. Now, in Ponte Vedra, uh, we had over six, 70 people uh, representing local governments. Mm. So I do feel that there's something happening here because I think all of those cities had the, the, the COVID experience and are really op trying to find ways to, to open up their municipal systems from the inside. Uh, what's together uh, local happy placemakers which we as Placemaker Europe find a, one of our main goals for the coming year. We've had a gathering in uh, Ponte Vedra proposing a, a cities in placemaking program, a two-year peer-to-peer learning program. Um, and what we see very often is that the people who come now are the pioneers within their municipalities. They feel very lonely within their municipalities, or they need each other's help and, and strength. And we're helping, trying to help them uh, through these programs to, to, to build out their networks, to strengthen their position within the municipalities and, uh, and learn a lot. Um, I've also had a personal uh, frustration last year. Uh, I know you're always looking at the city of Amsterdam, but I've been working in the city of Amsterdam in one of the lower income neighborhoods to, to get nine buckets for uh, urban farming done. Uh, this idea was completely embraced by the local population or was put forward by the local population, uh, the local residents, uh, in, and, and, and put together in one week, and the politicians embraced it in, in two days. And then it took me a year to get it through the municipal system. Just nine stupid buckets for uh, urban farming. And um, we also visited the city of Milan, and the city of Milan have embraced uh, this idea of tactical urbanism, basically placemaking, and um, they've launched a program for opening up uh, squares uh, uh, from uh, uh, parking places, turning them into two public squares. Um, they have a team ready, they have uh, paint ready, they have uh, furniture ready, a ping pong table. And uh, if the community comes forward and says, I would like to change my square, then they will come by and a month later it's done. And they've opened up 40 squares in, in three years time. So there's a bad example and a good example of uh, what it can mean if the system starts to embrace this idea of, uh, of placemaking, because in that one year I was fighting for my nine buckets, the city of Milan opened up 50 new squares and added 50 new squares to their city. So I think this is a, a very interesting development to see. Um, and for us, it's very much based also on our work of the uh, After COVID City manifesto that we uh, created within Placemaking X. Um, and with Placemaking Europe, uh, I'm really hoping to take those lessons out of COVID and bring them forward past COVID uh, now. And I think a year from now, we'll be hopefully talking about a similar development on the real estate side, but we're not there yet. Thanks, I want to share, 
I don't have much voice, but I want to share some stuff. Um, I'm Cheryl Muriente. I'm based in West Palm Beach. And I just did a big tour between uh, Vancouver at IDA. I was in Ponte Vedra, hosted a cafecito there and did a talk and actually a workshop. And then somehow I ended up in France and then Finland. And I'm back here now in Florida. And what's really interesting is that everywhere I go, I feel like um, there's a lot of cities I talk to outside of mine. I find that we have cultivated six years of a good relationship with our city to embrace placemaking. It took a long time, but we're, we're now at a place where I can help write policy based on the tests that we do within our bid. And so this is kind of a new symbiotic relationship that's finally happening. Uh, so post COVID, we have been able to change our parklet ordinance our um, sidewalk cafe seating to reflect what the people learned from those two years we were operating uh, like pirates. And so it's kind of interesting to see this shift. Uh, so we do want to share more of how, like I call it like placemaking therapy, put these people together with coffee and kind of get them to learn without saying I'm teaching. Uh, so that's one thing. But the other big thing that happened to us that I finally was able to do is instead of it calling it uh, participatory budgeting, we put out a grant for a big place making community engagement project, which is the biggest challenge I feel we have in America is giving true engagement to the community, not the three minutes at the podium at City Hall. And so we are bringing in in February, out of all places, a Finnish architect to work here with us uh, to do eight Trojan horses designed by children of the city of West Palm Beach built in West Palm Beach, collecting the voice of West Palm Beach and then bringing it to City Hall to attack it with love. And so it's kind of a military, anti-military tactic, uh, but also learning how these things that are so because I feel when we use creativity, that's when everybody comes out to the street and works with us. Uh, so those are the things that are coming. And I know I'll sit with Ryan and reevaluate cafecito i think that's been super huge learning experience for us uh just we have one hour to talk ourselves about themes that we are always dealing with uh, that are very human but i feel like we never have that safe space to express ourselves um so anyway that's that's what i'm sharing and i'm looking forward to working with ryan on whatever comes in 2023 Thanks, Cheryl. You've been such a critical part of this year's success. The monthly cafecito we've had, we've spoke with so many placemakers and they found a lot of value in that space and the kind of unstructured but purposeful conversations that we've had there and that you've managed to travel with us to Paris, to Spain, to Canada and really um, get us uh, conversing with so many people. So thank you so much for everything you did this year. And I look forward to working with you next year. And I see Alan has had his hand up there. You want to shout out, Alan? Sure, you just really Beach. quickly. Yeah, from Long Beach, California and uh, Studio 111. Um, thank you. I want to just echo a little up said about the comprehensive uh, presentation. I, I mean, every time you brought up a subject, I was like, yes, that's an important one. We're dealing with that in one way. Or another, and there's so much um, intersections between so many of the issues. They're not in separate buckets. So, equity, for instance, definitely deals with so many of the, the across so many of the different aspects. And the thing that I think we keep on thinking about a lot in Southern California on the Pacific Coast is mobility and the transition away from cars. It's such a big issue. Uh, the state is doing things from a reg regulation standpoint. And we're doing things from a design standpoint, but I feel like I'd love to hear more from this group and all the other um, upcoming seminars and, and opportunities, how we can continue that transformation. Um, because I think we still have a long ways to go, great, great places that aren't reliant on cars to get around. Um, one of the big projects we're, we're currently just starting, which touches a lot of the issues, we're on a team that's, um, our goal is to bring 3000 bus stops of amenities uh, shelter and shade to uh, uh, Los Angeles and something that's been tried for many years, actually two decades without success. So hopefully our team will be able to do that. It's a large multidisciplinary team. 
but it really touches on issues that are just exacerbated by climate change and heat and also the inequality of shade in our city, which is another very huge issue. So I look forward to just hearing from this great group about lessons learned and ways to approach future mobility. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. I hope we get to work more with you this year. Um, I saw that you, uh, along with some other really impressive placemakers in Long Beach, uh, got support from the Knight Foundation to support Long Beach's newest park, which was actually a reconstruction of their massive civic center complex that they reintegrated into the street fabric uh, and created this one of the most dynamic public spaces uh, in the downtown, but also that suffers from a lot of problems, no shade, uh, the need for programming without a sustainability plan. And so I hope we can work with you and help you on stuff like that this year. Yeah, I mean, we, we find, and a lot of poly cities have this, they're great at building things. And then after that, they really don't know what to do. So that's where the community needs to jump. Tim, it would be great to get you involved in that. I know you have some familiarity with downtown Long Beach for sure. And your experience with the Parks Alliance in New York would be really interesting. Um, Alexa, I saw you nodding a lot a little while ago. Did you want to share anything or that's resonating or makes sense for what you're working on next year? Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, maybe I'll introduce myself very quickly since I don't know a lot of you. Um, my name is Alexa Gonzalez. I am the principal and co-founder of Hive Public Space. Uh, we are a urban design and place making or placekeeping studio um, based out of New York City. Uh, but we're really, uh, I think one of the things that makes us a little bit different is that we're really trying to uh, design forward with our values. So it's like making sure that we're really tackling design justice and making sure that uh, public spaces are culturally and racially inclusive. So that means making sure that everyone is comfortable and making sure that uh, people do want to come into our spaces. Um, this group is thinking about um, how do we engage community, right? Like thinking about community engagement is such a big topic and, and there are wrong ways to definitely go about it and, and kind of treat the community in a very uh, transactional way. Um, but I'm curious to kind of like learn from people and to hear from people uh, in terms of like that engagement and things that worked and didn't work. Um, because I know every community is so unique um, that there really is no one formula that fits everyone, but um, learning from other people, I think it's uh, super important. So yeah, thanks everyone. And uh, looking forward to continue learning from you all and uh, feel free to reach out if, um, if you need anything. Thanks so much, Alexa. And I think you're also a wealth of knowledge with your background working at Bryant Park and then running your own firm that seems to be doing a lot of very interesting tactical engagement. So I recommend people follow you on Instagram to see all the good stuff that you're doing. Um, Jaron Thank over you, in Flint, it. the new placemaker in chief. <laughs> hey there, how are you guys all doing today? All right, thank you so much for the wealth of knowledge and information, all the links. I'm very excited to be here in this group of all of you. I know several of you on there, but there's a lot that I don't know. Um, my name is Jaron Sage. I'm the director of placemaking for downtown Flint, Michigan. Uh, I took over for Katie Yellow, who's now in Jacksonville. I don't think she's on the call anymore, but she was earlier. Um, what we got going on here is mostly resident-driven creative placemaking projects. So we're running with a, a basic formula of up to $2,000 per activation. And so we run around and try to find different ideas from within our community and identify different talents that we have and then use them to activate our public spaces. And as I say that, I have to correct myself because one of the biggest issues that we have here in downtown is that we don't really have public space. Um, almost everything is kind of private owned or even our green space and our parks are, are owned by developers or you know some of the bigger fish in the city and so I've been doing a lot of work just building relationships trying to figure out how we can remove the barriers to access those spaces because it's the closest thing that we have to use and so uh, we were able to participate in parking day this year it was super fun 
We ended up taking four different uh, parking spots in our main city center. We transformed them into just public lounge space. We had some pop-up music. We had a couple open mics. Uh, we had um, art going on all ages. So that was a really cool thing that we did for the, that was my first time doing that. And the first time in I think eight years um, that the city participated in. So, uh, you know, with, with our resident driven programming, what we're seeing is a lot of creative ideas that come out that wouldn't have normally been able to happen because of the financial barriers. Um, so one of the struggles we're finding is always having to come up with more funding and more sponsors to keep the show going, I guess, right? And so something that we found works well is I'm starting to build this model where that $2,000, I'm looking for it to be matched. And so whether that's in kind with people's time or their work or some of the resources they may already have, I found that it was, uh, I'm able to add value to the overall um, budget of the picture and then in the line items, be able to actually show where the residents and the people are putting in valuable time that's worth money. And so uh, before we're doing the project, we're able to show some of these sponsors and funders and everybody where that work is coming in and where they're going to see a match from the community. And so just kind of using that, I've been able to raise a little bit more money than just uh, what we would normally have for our placemaking budget. Um, but I'm curious if anyone else, you know, out there has any kind of similar troubles or any suggestions as far as uh, how they're interacting with with your municipalities and, and your donors and people around. Um, and if there's any kind of, you know, maneuvers that you found that might be able to help you leverage those dollars that you already have or leverage the talent that you already are utilizing within your communities. Um, so that's just something I wanted to bring up. And then I dropped in the in the chat there, I dropped a link. It's um, reality8.com. The world. So this is a global, global invitation. And this is an augmented reality company. It's a small company. It's just a husband and wife that own it. So they they do all the programming. They created the hardware, they create the software, and they can, they can make just about anything you could ever dream come to true in this augmented reality world, and they have the hardware to back it up. And so um, this, this last year, we worked together and we created a one-of-a-kind walkable exhibit that's 76 feet long and 30 feet wide that you can only experience here in Flint, Michigan, that you put the goggles on. And you can, I can put this in any open space that there is and have our guests be able to walk through four different uh, worlds. And so it'll take you through the desert, it'll take you through the ocean, it'll take you through the jungle, and then it'll take you through this fantasy world. And within each of these worlds is a completely immersive experience um, where you can walk all the way around things, you can walk under things, and you'll have things like um, jaguars or dolphins or 50 foot unicorns, um, all sorts of just really fun, playful stuff to show the idea of the concept um, that we're trying to build out. And I love that you were talking about using AR to put different statues in the spots of the pedestals, Ryan, um, because in Flint, Michigan, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but this is the birthplace of General Motors and the first place that uh, the world heard about a carriage having a motor on it. And so in Flint, we have crumbling infrastructure of what used to be the number one per capita place to live, uh, number one place to raise a family, absolutely amazing city that has experienced some of the most tragic loss I've ever seen as far as population. Um, the housing is crazy, the, the economy, all that stuff. And so to pay tribute to that, we want to recreate some of these factories and recreate some of those everyday scenes that you would see at a carriage factory right here in the in the old locations um, of those factories. And so, you know, it's kind of a, a large project that I'm working on, but I really, you know, I just wanted to share that resource that Nigel and Ann are there with Reality 8. 
and they're just fantastic to work with. So if anyone's experimenting or even dreaming about augmented reality or being able to bring that to your city, um, I highly recommend reaching out to them. Um, Thanks so much, you know. Jaren. You know, I think yeah. we really want to stay engaged with you and Flint. We had our first placemaking week in Flint and we're able to bring 25 placemakers from across the country there as well as uh, local people who signed up to attend and it was such a, a building block for our network and I think Flint is such an um, important story and place and I'm so glad that you're in the seat uh, and we, we know you need backup as well so um Ethan and I can hopefully connect you with the Michigan Municipal League and also patronicity for some of those fundraising things you talked about. And I was also hoping, you know, you uh, attended our place make, first placemaking mastery trip to Portland, Oregon. And so if you could share anything about, you know, your experience with that and getting to meet some of the placemakers there who don't always get out on the road and you kind of have to go to them to see what's going on. Yeah, I would love to. Um, I mean, I could talk for a week about that. Uh, we had just such a fantastic time. I met some, some of the most incredible people. Uh, we got to really take a super deep dive into Portland. And many of you know, Portland is one of the most place made cities on the planet um, with just non-stop activity and action going on so you know I, I, some of the highlights that I could take away from that were absolutely um, you know the progression of getting in touch with the physical geographical place which is in Portland Oregon um, it's just it's magical it's beautiful and the way that we started the mastery program where we were able to really connect with that and see what is that physical main attraction that a lot of people had to Portland um, was able for me to, to kind of reflect back and say, well, what are the geographical things that are attractive about where I live or about some of the places that I've traveled that I really enjoyed? And how can I tap into that to really to capture the essence? Of but um, with the days to follow was just um, mind blowing almost uh, the amount of talent and the amount of thought that has been put in to each of the steps that have happened in there um, was just so affirming that I'm not insane or alone. And so, you know, I want to thank you all for being on here in this crazy adventure of placemaking, because uh, for so long, I really did think I was um, crazy for thinking the way I was or for dreaming the way I was or wanting the results in the place that I'm at. Um, so, you know, I, I highly recommend, I mean, I, like I said, I could go on forever about it, but um, any of these mastery programs that pop up, I have full confidence that Ryan is going to um, curate that to be highly effective for having fun for learning, for networking, uh, for eating good. He will absolutely make sure you're getting good food wherever you go. Um, you know, so just it, anytime an opportunity like that pops up, if you have the means and resources, just take, take the trip and go. Absolutely go. Thanks so much. It was a real pleasure to hang out with you and, and get to learn alongside you. Uh, that was just an incredible trip. And I think it's something we'd like to do annually to take people to Portland to see what's going on there and reflect it back to their own environments. I actually got to see Alan there the last day I was there as well. So that was really fun to hang out in the park. Um, Chris, you want to go ahead and say your piece? Yeah, I just want to, um, thinking towards next year, um, just wanted to have a shout out for stories and storytelling and story making because you're all doing great things. And, you know, we have the film festival um, that's in Detroit. It's going to be next week. And we collect stories about placemaking from all around the world. Um, but we have this flagship festival every year in Detroit and um, in, in October. The date may flip around it, but think about creating stories that um, you may want to you know, put in the festival um, or in other types of places. Um, so yeah, just a, a shout out for your own story making. And if you need some, some guidance or some help and how to tell good stories, um, how to get the story across, we can help you with that too. Um, 
on the on the other side of the of the house because <laughs> we you know we do the story the storytelling um work and we do the story showing work uh go to our, um our website i put it on there bettercitiesfilmfestival.com we don't have what we call you know with the better cities film festival we have a more better the more better is all the events so like um Steve Mon is going to come and talk um, over cocktails about he, how he invested in rehabilitating um, the Wurlitzer of building into the, you know, the Siren Hotel. That's a fun event. <laughs> you know, we have um, after um, after show parties and and we got a you know a walking tour you know and so on and so forth. We're going to hopefully look at what they're doing down at the um, at the waterfront and connecting the city. You know. To, you know to the river and so on and so forth and a whole bunch of folks coming in from around the country uh the president of cnu is going to be there and so on and so forth so the the festival is films and then all the stuff that's happening around it to make it a fun you know three or four days and um hopefully some of your stories will be in it next year Thanks, Chris. And we hope people can make it to Detroit um, for the festival either next week or next year and know some of our uh, local friends connected with you and are going to come out. But also we uh, had a great experience working with you uh, with our own city. And what you did was put together a custom reel of the movies that you have uh, for the issues that we're facing in our city. You know, we talked about Latino cities and uh, arts and culture and transportation and housing. And we're able to pick uh, a series of shorts and then show them at our local cinema. And it was really affordable and uh, an awesome thing that people can do to bring the, the films to, to their city. So highly uh, endorse that uh, as well. Um, we're running low on time, but I just wanted to see if Todor or Tina or, uh, you know, um, if you had anything you wanted to share. You want to go? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the overview. And I'm um, uh, very, thanks for the invitation as well. I'm very happy to join you. For this comparison between Europe and the uh, US of how placemaking is developing, I think with Ryan, we had a lot of conversations. What we're doing together with him, it's uh, we already have this nice tradition that we have uh, something, well, two testing concepts. Some of you probably have uh, heard about that we just gather for early days. One of the moments that we do that uh, for uh, in, in the month of April. Uh, we gather for a few webinars in which we kind of try to encourage people to do tactical interventions, very small things, some, some people do bigger things, but it doesn't matter. It's more about having this uh, momentum of community between this network, because that's actually a great thing about us. We are placed all around the world and we can actually do a lot of things together. So I think we will do it. It's already in the calendar. We recently did something similar for parking day that we have to also having a closing session. So Jaren, I think we uh, will approach you for that and share some of your experiences. But the idea is really that uh, I think it's a great thing that some some of you already have said it, that it's uh, it's great to f don't feel alone in what we're doing. And I think a lot of these efforts, there is no recipe of how municipalities are doing that or how, how it's structured something that to work, it's all about the people that are behind very often, and we all like try to find our own ways. Uh, so I think I, I would like to, of course, uh, stay connected with the uh, people in US because I think you have very nice attitude of just doing things uh, like faster. We sometimes lo lose ourselves in Europe in bureaucracy too much. I know that bureaucracy exists everywhere, but I think there is a little bit of distinction how we do it. Um, so in that sense, I think we'll put some of the events next year that we try to collaborate between Europe and US with this really uh, just do just do it kind of uh, interventions. I think uh, uh, through Ryan, you will probably learn about them and uh, let's see how it will go. But I think it's, uh, we'll stay in touch. So looking forward, thanks. 
Thanks, Todor. You know, you're the original international collaborator for us, and it's been so fun working with you on the tool tests. Uh, each year, we've done the Placemake Earth tool test around Earth Day, and then just recently, we did the Parking Day tool test. And my one hope for us for next year is, you know, in Santa Ana, in my municipality, we've been able to put up small grants for people to participate in the tool tests. And each time, you know, about five $1,000 grants, and each of those people have completed their projects, they've moved on to being bigger impact placemakers. Uh, and these are people who'd never heard of placemaking, who have no background in urbanism. They're just the neighbors and the locals. And um, I hope that like we can get more bids and, and small funders to get behind their placemakers to participate so that we see people complete their projects and really grow and accelerate as they're part of that international learning community. And maybe folks like Jaron, who already has a, a resident-led you know, $2,000 program can join us uh, as well as others so that we can get more and more uh, people to buy in. And uh, Tina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in real quickly. Just um, uh, what Hans and I guess Tim, is he here? He guess he left. Um, we're saying about neighborhoods, I think is really uh, inspiring and what I'm trying to push here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so I'm really seeing how the bid in the downtown is struggling. They've been very disconnected with the residents and the neighborhoods. And I'm starting this uh, Placemaking Raleigh initiative, which is really neighborhood led and having events in smaller chunks within the neighborhood on a regular basis. And I've already seen the city responding that they've started an initiative of having community connectors, people who come out in the community now and find out what people want. Um, they've started, I have a little placemaking um, toolkit that we lend around the city and they've started one in response to that. And so a lot, I see a lot of the initiatives pushing from the outside being mirrored by the city and they are trying, I do see differences. And um, so that's really encouraging because I really think that there's so much untapped potential in the neighborhoods and that, that really is the bottom up. And that is where people feel like they have permission perhaps to do something versus the, 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 at the city scale down and it's more accessible not only to homeowners in streets and neighborhoods but to placemakers as well just to take these smaller bites making a difference and and it's easier to communicate with people to do something within the street within the neighborhood so that's been my focus and it's just been really interesting to see how the city's responded and embracing it and I think it's true they're open now they're much more open now than they than they were before so hopefully you can come see that some of that on your train trip and uh, we can connect then. Thanks, Tina. You've been a, such an MVP for the network, uh, <laughs> you know, the United Streets program, the tool test, the road trip. You've been so involved in the webinars that you've produced. So we really look forward to working with you next year. And I also see the leadership that you're developing in your city and I think that you're going to have a lot more resources soon and more people behind the great work you're doing. Thanks, Ryan. So we'll go ahead and call this a wrap. Sorry, my timing was a little off. We went a little longer than I thought, but that's why you do things the first time so you know how to do them a little better the next time. So thank you guys so much for joining us. This was really, really uh, helpful to get all that learning out of my brain and um, also to start to the conversation for next year. And I really look forward to collaborating with you guys and continuing to expand our reach and mature our network. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Bye. You're a star. Thanks, see you.